bring up the first application <coughs> of this um, technology, which I have called knowledge for optimization. And the way how I see this is um, it is applied to organizations. And it's very similar to if we have the organization as a human body, the body parts where we have the data at the bottom. And then we have the organizational structure um, on top of the body parts. And then we have the business process, and that's how far we got in the past. And that's how many consultants made their money. The problem is, and uh, I stumbled into that myself, and I still was a consultant working for companies like PwC or Deloitte. You have all these big manuals that describe the business process that nobody follows them. And now <laughs> what we can do with our approach, we look at the knowledge flow. And that's how those emails or web accesses or blog posts or phone calls, or if you have the social badges and um, the human interactions, um, how they flow within the organization, and how does this work? Here I have an example from my own time when I was um, working for Deloitte, where we had an IT project, where we had those communities, we had some people in the center, and the consultants working for a customer, and building uh, a bespoke, uh, custom developed IT system and what we see the most well integrated thing is the lawyer. That's <laughs> very typical, but probably not how it should have been. And what we also see is that the customers are nowhere. Which is not very good. <laughs> and when I was involved in this project, I was actually one of the guys in here, um, we didn't really notice what was going on. And so here is another snapshot. Again, we see something which is not good. You see here one guy <coughs> who is really totally central. And this, it actually turned out, this was our most junior consultant. And he was the <laughs> only one who knew the method. That's why <laughs> all went to him. And he was always complaining to me that he was totally overworked and underpaid and totally frustrated. And I didn't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at those pictures, at the knowledge flow inside the project, it becomes very um, uh, apparent. And um, over time, you see here, in the end, we succeed. So um, the consulting leaders and the customers, they got together, they started forming one team, the technical core team. This guy is still very central, but there are others which are um, learning the method. So, um, so this is sort of uh, how we then ended. Um, this uh, is the between us curve over time that tells you when there were phases in the project where one guy was dominating the entire um, communication. And this sort of analysis can give you insights into what's going on in a project or organization that are nearly impossible to get in other ways. So that's sort of how, in a nutshell, um, the knowledge optimization thing works. And I will show you now um, a bunch of practical examples. But before I do that, let me also explain to you what the individual characteristics of the people are that we are looking for. Which ones are the leaders? What, what are the characteristics in social networking terms of uh, the people that, that um, are good leaders of swarms that create the new trends. How do they communicate? And I would like to go back in history and look at some old examples of famously created people. This here is one, and that's not the guy, that's his boss. Um, that's the Duke of Milan, but uh, the most creative person, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, I don't know whether he was the most creative person, but is frequently nominated as being one of the most creative persons. Um, what we see here is um, one of these inventions, which is not very famous, but which sets a great example. It's uh, called the Imperial Dinner in China, 
And here invented the same thing, creates paintings out of food stuff. And so what he did, in, um, he was hired to set up um, such an imperial dinner for the Duke of Milan, and which means he needed the artists and he needed the chefs. And because the environment in a medieval kitchen was really chaotic, he was predicting there would be chaos in the kitchen. And so he invented a sprinkler system in case there would be a fire in the kitchen. And then the big day came. The artists and the chefs were in the kitchen. They started fighting with each other. The sprinkler system went off and everything, everybody wrong. Because he had done a miscalculation of the sprinkler system. So, but the point is, <laughs> two months later he had another interview with him, which was a big success. <laughs> So the bottom line is, don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> um, another great role models of uh, those people that are the most settled ones in those throngs is this guy here, Marco Polo. And there were other people in the Middle Ages that had claimed to have done big travels, that claimed to have done, done uh, been in far away countries, and they told of things that people could believe, like um, uh, people with lion's heads, like um, uh, women giving birth to dogs, but not such crazy things like printed money, or um, because everybody knew in those days that if you wanted um, uh, to copy something, you had to write it by hand. And what Marco Polo told was that there was a country somewhere where there was something like a printing press, and nobody would believe that. Um, or like this never-ending war, um, or having uh, printed money. Um, those were all things that people in Europe couldn't do. Only, in the end, it turned out he was right. And what he did, he wrote this, this book that changed the view of medieval Europe. And the way how he wrote it was the reason for the success, because there were those other writers that wrote about the people with the lion's heads and women giving birth to dogs and so on, and they themselves were the heroes. They always married the princess and became the king themselves. Whereas Marco Polo just told the story and kept himself in the background, and that worked so much better. But that gets me to the um, uh, biggest role model of all, and that's this guy here, which in um, the US usually I don't have to ask who he is, whereas in Europe people don't know this, <coughs> and he speaks very well. And, um, this is one of his most well-known inventions, the Franklin stove. So this is Benjamin Franklin, in case somebody hasn't realized <laughs> uh, known as the picture. And he refused to patent his invention. He shared it with everybody. And which means that like 10 years after he had come up with the idea, it was already spread out everywhere across the US and in Europe. And he did other things. He created a group, a coin, uh, learning network of people, which is called the Junto, that um, together as a group created the first town library of Philadelphia, that um, uh, created the public firefighters, and I think that also was um, very instrumental in creating the US postal system. And he did all of those things in the same way as Leonardo da Vinci, very strong, not giving up, and like Marco Polo, keeping himself in the background. And so those <coughs> are the main characteristics of uh, those people. Um, I think you know, I've already touched on those things. It means you are not just very intelligent, but also socially intelligent. You are willing to team up. You are very stubborn, and you are very good to communicate. And those are all things that you can get out automatically, for example, from your email account. And the contribution index is one approximation. You might remember those dots that we discussed before, that the most active people are here. And then, depending on how much of a sender or a receiver you are, you are up and down, and then you get different draws. And Benjamin can be probably be somewhere here. And Leonardo, by organizing this imperial dinner, he would be um, uh, up on this other side, very active. So those are things that you can get out automatically. And 
what the people here do. They are the core nucleus of what I call a coin, a collaborative innovation network. And the way to get them out is looking at their communication pattern along three dimensions. The first one, how well connected are you? Between them. Centrality. So we get that out very easily. How responsive are you? If I say to Nina, does it take you 10 days to answer or 10 minutes? And obviously, to be for a good team player, he's very responsive. So we can get that out automatically. And then how sharing are you? And we can get that out by looking at the content of the email and the, um, your, uh, get those threads where um, content is being shared. So those three dimensions you can get out automatically and, and try to find the coins. And how do coins look like um, in social networks, in social network structure? So obviously those are the people we want. Um, and for that, let me give you an example that most of you might be familiar with. That's Linus Provence and today have we created Linux. He was Benjamin Franklin in the center. Mix of Leonardo and Marco Polo. And he created this point that everybody talks to everybody. And then over time, they were joined by other people that thought having working on a uh, new flavor of Unix, a new flavor of operating system would be a very cool thing. And they form groups like the video group, and there are other Linux communities, and they form a learning community. And in social network communities means they were not so communicated um, uh, connected among themselves, but very connected at the same time. And then over time, they were joined by the general users, and they would be interacting with places like Slashdot, and they would connect even less among themselves, but they might be connected to see what the core people in here. And if we look at the social network pictures, we get pictures like this one, which is seven years ago, a snapshot of my mailbox at Deloitte, um, where we have a group of people working on a new service offering, which is the way for consultancy to be created. So you package a slide deck of PowerPoint slides and you call that a new service offering and then you go out and sell it. And that's how the core team interacts with everybody with everybody. But then you have the people that learn about <coughs> it. So they are connected really with among themselves, but most of the people in the point. And then over time you have the people in the industry that are only connected to the, to the, to the core. And this sort of networking structure, where we have the coin in the center, and then the learning group uh, farther out, and then interest people um, at the periphery, that's a thing we can get out very easily to <coughs> learn it, and that's the pattern of innovation development. And let me show you some more pictures here. And the beauty, by the way, is that this is sort of a never-ending style of innovation. If you look at Linux, up to today, it has always worked beautiful. If you look at the World Wide Consortium, where today they are doing other things, like the semantic type or RDF, you have to call in the to get a learning network, you have the interest network, and then inside of the interest network, you might get new points, and so on. So this always goes on. And here is, again, my Deloitte mailbox, the innovation network, again, learning network growing over time, and then the interest network um, with new points being born and taken off. So this, this pattern here, that's what we are trying to spot. Now, what does it mean for yourself? What's a good if you think you are an innovator um, and you will be able to look at your own communication pattern if you 
if you are um, uh, interested or great enough or whatever, in the last hour and load it into Condor, um, then you might be either a star or a galaxy. And what I found in when um, teaching this um, extended version of this class a couple of times is John D. S. Galaxy, Galaxy, that's a great predictor of those um, creators of points. Now, this does not mean, by no means, that you are a bad person who turns out to communicate as a star. It's just a different type of personality. This here is an excellent programmer but he is not communicating very actively with other people. This guy here is the president of the student council. He did an internship in India with a consulting company, and he also is very active in the IT group of this university. And in my project on the day um, in the when I took the class, they, they created a really nice application because he was able to draw on his very um, right network. But of course you need people like the other guy, great coders, to help you. So it's usually you spot. But again, if you want to see where those patterns of innovation start, look out for the guys. So that's um, the what I have to say about how to find strong credibility. But, um, Yes, it's not better or worse as far as the individual is concerned, but if you want to um, uh, spot the trains, you will spot them around the galaxy as they spread them out. They are embedded in groups of people. And if you want to find the people which are excellent communicators, they communicate as galaxies because they share the links, they introduce other people. Um, this here might be somebody like Donald Trump. He is the star of his own universe. But he probably doesn't introduce many other people to each other. Whereas this guy here is embedded into crowds of other people and um, they might communicate through him, but they might also sometimes hurt him. Yes. Yeah. In terms of, I have a related question, which is, uh, is troubled me for uh, some time. I, I heard the story uh, maybe a year ago that uh, uh, it was uh, a medical person in the corporation who uh, values uh, doctors uh, for, for funding research projects uh, much higher if they are very quick to respond. You mentioned that as one of the dimensions. But then the issue is that if they're in a star pattern, that they're going to get busier and busier as they get recognized, and they're not going to be able to respond quickly anymore unless, you're, unless they recognize that there's a very important corporation contacting them with something great to offer, mm -hmm. and that was going they will respond very quickly. So that would suggest that uh, the galaxy pattern would be much better because you're going to swamp out your stars. It's much more robust. Yeah. And we have in the field, and uh, someone will talk more about some medical applications, also done some analysis of some star doctors. And star doctors communicate as stars. And they have a real problem because everybody wants to talk to them. And so, so and, and I guess it's also some little bit of an ego thing. Like Ben, with Ben uh, Franklin, giving up some of your connections and sharing them with others. But that's what he did. And that's how he was able to get off the trends. But if you are the world's biggest brain surgeon, probably people want to watch you, how you do your operation. So you will be a star and you will remain a star. Overall, though, um, the galaxy pattern will help you be more successful. Yeah. I, if I'm analyzing my own email flow, uh, it seems I can't go out very far. I, if I'm looking at just my own, I can see who I'm sending to and who's sending to me. So how do I get those other ones in there? Okay. That is the main box of us. Well, how do I get it? If because you have the CC links. Just load it and try it and it will work. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it seems I'm still missing something. If George, is, if George is communicating to Peter around me, 
right. and I'm not CC'd on those, my email flow isn't going to show that. That's an excellent point, and there are indeed ego networks and social networks and social network language, and you would like to be involved and watch from above, and you can be involved if you are in an organization and that you do the public email archive. Right. And um, sometimes you are just uh, yourself, and you look at your own, it's called the ego network, but in previous classes, I saw pictures like this one, where the owner of the mailbox was here. And everybody was communicating around him. And that tells you something. Now, in that particular case, it turns out his girlfriend was the center of his network. <laughs> 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 so, but, but the point is, and just try it. You will see it works. Just take three email messages with two and CC and draw the lines, and you will see that you can construct structures where you will be at the periphery of your network. If you tell a lot about who you are. Okay, so let me um, uh, give you a few more examples. Why communicating as stars is actually a good idea. And the first one is from a project we did analyzing how the software startups in Israel. There, um, we were really lucky with the communication networks of the managers in 1999. So we have the social network of who among their competitors, the CEO, was talking. And those were small companies of 10 to like 200 or 300 people. And then a couple of years later, we checked which of the companies were still around. And it turns out that by just looking at the communication pattern, before the EBS is public first, by the way, we predict you whether um, you survive. So the point I make here is that the communication pattern indeed can predict like the swarms of these some things. So the first interesting prediction was that or what we found out is the ones which refuse to participate in our project had a much higher chance to go out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and I always like to spew that guy when we make a good But there is again my old argument of the altruism, of because the CEOs which were willing to participate in the research project, which means they didn't get an immediate benefit because some it was an interest, I think it was an um, the Technium, it was um, a Technium project. So the ones who were willing to collaborate with the Technium, um, they got predicted whether they go out of business or not. But then, of course, there was also the other things, like um, the more you spoke with your competitors, the higher the chances of survival. And that's quite amazing. Now, um, here is, by the way, the structures. And then there was something which was even more amazing. The little the non survivors communicated, they prefer to talk to other non survivors. So it seems birds of a feather talk together. And so called homophily in uh, sociology. Similar people talk to similar people, and it seems that somehow, subconsciously, you can predict or um, uh, if you like to talk to um, uh, similarly minded people. And that was right. I think this is quite amazing. Um, so that's one example. Another one was um, totally um, a different application. We wanted to know um, whether the cell phone patterns of students would predict which ones would be the most innovative students. In this case, it was a class of high school students who got free cell phones in return for sharing all their communication panel with the cell phone company which they gladly agreed, and the company did an analysis like that. They just looked at how active people were, and um, I mean, this already tells you quite something. For example, this student here, he is totally technology refuser, <laughs> because he never responds. But he was considered a really cool student. That means they were always sending him SMS, and uh, calling him, and he didn't respond. So you can tell that he's popular. But um, uh, the company thought that those guys here, they are the ones that they would like to um, uh, 
support because the other ones actually use the technology so they get others to use the system. But what we did, we did the social network analysis, and that was actually um, uh, another PhD student, Matt Long, who did this project. Um, and what he did, he compared the full network, 17 students in the center, and the way how they communicated with 2,000 other people with the network of just the 17 students themselves. And I have here and here some dummy names just to be able uh, to refer to them. And what he found out is that the influential ones are the ones which are in the core of both networks. Because you have people that are gay people, that means they talk a lot outside of the class, but they are not very central in the class. Then you have the other um, uh, symptoms where you have the people which are very central in the class, but they are not communicating outside, and the influential ones are the ones which combine inside and outside. And um, he found that out, and could then, for example, look at a movie like this one, which will show you how um, the innovations are being adapted. Each red dot is a student, and each gray dot is a product, which is either using um, uh, some dedicated service. At that time, there were, it's actually a European company, there were soccer championships, so the students could get soccer results and so on. And so what you will see is how the students uh, use those services and how student nine, which is the most influential one, experiments with the new products and then gets others to use it. Can you give us a sense of what these products are? Yes, um, it's, it's like I'm uh, sending video SMS. It's, um, it's all the value added products that the cell phone company wants the kids um, uh, downloading ringtones, everything that costs money. <laughs> now in this example they got it for free so that's of course the big um, uh, drawback is that the results might not be uh, totally representable um, but still what's the communication pattern of people that get others to use those free products and what turned out what was the pattern was um, if you are um, central in both your peer network and the global network. That was the predict. So this suggests that in certain kinds of networks, uh, in certain kinds of content in these products, you may have a, a lot of adoption by certain individuals or by the group per month, let us say. Whereas in others, uh, uh, you may have very small adoption. The mention of this is exactly what the uh, literature on adoption says, that it, it, it helps to be, have strong interconnections in the communication. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what you can uh, find out here very easily. Okay, I noticed that uh, at least the beginning part of your movie there, there's three at the, the corner there, and you're kind of just talking to each other and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Reflect what you're saying. Exactly, and, and those unconnected people, some of them were high volume users, but what they did, they were just um, uh, connecting through the cell phones with the laptop to the internet, which means from perspective of the cell phone company, and it's nice because it creates revenue, but they didn't really attract others. Or maybe they have one or two friends, but they're, they're, they're this tiny little group themselves. Yes. They're not connected. Exactly. So I'm kind of curious, Aaron, we have things like the word of mouth marketing association. If uh, number nine is so successful in getting so many people to adopt value added services, is this person compensated for adding value to the bottom line? Well, in this particular example, they all of them were conversating about in getting free cell phones. But I guess that's a good marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. You should try to identify people who would be good, you know, 
That's right. That's what we are. That's the point here. Because we can predict it now. Because if we find that this this pattern of if you are central in the peer group and central in the bigger network, that predicts this behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, another thing is that of course, depending on the application, the pattern might be totally different. I will show you an example where um, hierarchical communication pattern is the best for one way of the of things. Whereas totally decentralized communication patterns is the um, good for the other way of things and this example is actually coming right here and it's the Eclipse open source developer community where we look at programmers, open source programmers for Eclipse which is a Java development environment and we looked at how creative groups were and how high performed groups were then we measure credibility as numbers of enhancements implemented over total <coughs> numbers of bugs and enhancements over time. And we measure productivity as just numbers of bugs fixed, numbers of out of all bugs um, uh, submitted. So what we were able to do, we were able to measure um, how productive the group was and how creative the group was over time. And then we also measure social networking stuff. And what we found is that we, there is a, a pattern that predicts high performance. And there is a pattern that predicts high credibility. And the pattern is changes in the business of the team over time. The more it oscillates, the more creative the team is. The more it is steady, the more high performing the team is and credibility and performance are negatively correlated. A team is either creative or a team is productive, but we do not both. And uh, we, in this case, we just look at them um, uh, like 30 or 40 um, uh, in these teams. Um, and I think there is a very um, a good explanation for this phenomenon and because if, um, in a credibility setting, communication structure moves between <coughs> the coin-like diamonds in where everybody talks to everybody. There's a centralized pattern where one guy pushes out an idea, then the group talks everybody with everybody, and then they have a centralized structure again. New idea, then decentralized, they talk with each other. Centralized, one guy is excited and pushes it out, and so on. And this oscillation thing, that predicts credibility. And on the other hand, if it's very steady and you have either a structure where everybody comes to everybody or a structure where one guy is the coordinator, that predicts high performance. But these things are not very clear. So by looking at those curves, you can tell whether people are productive or highly trained. And we have, I will show you probably next week, an analysis of a bank there we were able to look at those people and then we would, we could identify call center people that were much better off in the marketing department and the other way around. The building productivity uh, means also efficiency and efficiency means repetition and reduction of changes. Uh, so it makes good sense to expect productivity to be non-creative, which is by definition ruining or eliminating what is for the purpose of creating what is not yet. Yeah. No, I mean, in the case of the bank, it was really very clear, and we had those boss and employees, they were very, um, did their credited tasks, and so they had very steady structure, and you will see the curves, and the difference is really striking. So now, um, for the last um, uh, example, before we do the Condor um, uh, application, I would like to pass to Samar, if you are ready. And for the bankers or for the, the bankers it was easy. One you made for each branch of this, now it's a mortgage as well. But, uh, but here it was numbers of bucks fixed, 
productivity and numbers of enhancements implemented. Um, coming up with enhancements and implementing them, that was very really difficult. Network of the factory, which is and the social network comprises the, the 
the nurses, and the head nurse, the charge nurse in the faculty. What happens to them during these two peaks, during these two time men in the day, that will be weightless peaks and the patient will be weightless. So we've essentially converted a workflow problem into a social network analysis. That is how we established the work. And we did uh, the social network analysis by administering a paper-based survey. Obviously, there are better ways of administering a survey now. There are social values which automatically detect whether people are talking to each other, so on and so forth. But we administered a paper-based survey, and so this was the questionnaire. It was administered to five spe specific rooms in the factory. And uh, we logged face-to-face. -face. We asked them to log whether they were having a face-to-face, -face, phone, page, or an email interaction. Obviously, MacPack was a good interaction for face to face. And we also asked them to indicate how they were feeling. But if the business index also comes in later, it, it, it's pretty interesting how the networks develop around the business index. So, uh, just let me just revise the concepts that Peter discussed. And uh, using these concepts, we try to predict how stress occurs, but let's just revise the concepts. What happens during stress and the bottleneck is that a certain group of people become very central. So the, we call it an increase in group between the centrality. The person becomes more central and DVC near one. It's very clear here. Now this person will start interacting more and more, so his degree increases, till the person reaches a peak and it is physically impossible to interact or talk with more people, so that's a decrease in degree. And at the same time, the rest of the network, the density drops. So this person has become more central, he's talking more and more, and other people are talking less and less. So this person is becoming more and more. So essentially we look at three things, DVC, degree, and density. And that's exactly what happens in our faculty study. There are two central roles, the faculty partners <coughs> and the OA. And these are a snapshot from Condor, and I'll correspond with the problem from a bottle like with them. So you can see that the DVC is spiking exactly during those two time man in the day that we discussed, that we showed that the weightless is peaking. You can see the GPC spike in there. You can see that the network density increases, the size of the dot represents the density, sorry, the person's density increases, so the first people are speaking more and more, sorry, the degree increases, they're speaking more and more. And the network density drops, the yellow part drops, so other people are speaking less and less. What does GPC stand for? Group between the centrality. And the person becomes more central within the network. And so this is the bottleneck. It's a typical bottleneck. So essentially, that's what I think the lady here asked yeah. that you can predict the occurrence of a bottleneck in any network. And in this case, we're predicting the occurrence of a virtual bottleneck in this network. So obviously, this, uh, sorry, I, I just added this shot <laughs> sitting here. Uh, you can see that this is not a learning network. In fact, it's a pretty static network. There is the charge nurse and the OA who are always more central, and the rest of the nurses are at a lower level, and it just progresses in time. So the, it's, it's a very static network, which we try to change. If we make these people less central, and we make the uh, uh, network more collaborative, probably the efficiency will increase. And that was the whole idea. What we saw was that we were trying to find another way of making this network function rather than just stressing out two particular people. And we saw that there was an informal network appearing of at least four names that we could, four, four nurses in the, in the network that we could decipher. And when they saw that the charge nurse and the OA were getting overwhelmed and getting stressed, they were informally, informally collaborating to uh, network with the flows, create vacancies, and push the patients out. And therefore, the, the, the whole solution began, became to empower these four or five or six or seven extra people who, who had outgoing personalities and who, who would, on their own, take initiative to speak downstream with the flow and create vacancies, uh, vacant slots for the patient to go to. The whole idea became to empower them formally so that the network, the, uh, sorry, this diagram becomes more diffuse, so there's less of a steep curve here, and, and uh, the, the nurses in this area start interacting more, and the people here start getting less stress, the, 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 the number of interactions reduce to make the network more even. 
Okay. Uh, now the busyness index is also something that we uh, we, we saw we, we logged during the, uh, during the survey, and you can see that the, there's a in these three snapshots which are time series, there's a background gray network that typically occurs during any time in the vacuum, and the blue network emerges at the times of weightless or stress, and it disappears. So if you run a if you run a movie, the blue network appears and disappears <coughs> over the background the gray network, and so the whole idea became that if we reduce the total stress in the system, the blue network should not appear at all. If everybody is collaborating with everybody, and the stress should not happen at all. And one way to do that, do that was to improve the, uh, 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 the hierarchy, the reporting hierarchy. Right now, the charge nurse talks to everything who talks to the floor. There is a very formal hierarchy. The other nurses have only an informal way of talking to the floor. In case we empower the nurses to speak directly to the floor and admitting that if we can change the organization structure, we are able to migrate the one-way communication to a two-way communication and pick up the more informal collaborative method. So that is an answer to uh, changing organization structure and communication methodology to improve So uh, my last slide. Uh, some key recommendations, I think they're self-explanatory. Uh, in any generic uh, uh, situation, uh, one way to improve efficiency and throughput would be to identify key knowledge experts, not only the, the selected few, but the diffuse knowledge uh, experts <coughs> in the system, and give them a formal status in, in the hierarchy. Improve knowledge sharing and transparency amongst them through IT tools, that's what we just spoke about, that it's not just mere collaboration communication, for example, in the form example that he gave the bees, if people have internet access, so actually made a difference in the data example. So that people talk to each other is one aspect, but giving them IT tools to be able to perform the task uh, properly is a, 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 a better way to improve collaboration. Shorten process steps. Some process steps can get very long winded in very tall hierarchies to so make the hierarchy flat like we did in this example. And create some incentives which is that's my part of the presentation. Thank you very much, I guess. It's great. Any questions? I'll take one of the questions and then we'll move on. That's all right. Did they take your advice or your recommendations? And did they put it in the group? Yes. This has been the basis of keeping trees there. Interest and awareness in social network analysis. This was a very, very study. They have agreed to uh, to do a funded research with us in February for using the social tags and come up with a more comprehensive method. Because what we did was we had a paper based service to only have one of the So that's point number one. Point number two is yes, these recommendations have gone into the internal committee and uh, uh, they, are, they are waiting to. In this aspect, uh, the, the organization st structure is such that two different departments, uh, vertical hierarchies, at the lower level they want to create common incentives. For example, one incentive can be to reduce instances of the data software. And so incentivize the nurses on both sides to talk to the so Yes, they are. But I think, Samar, the biggest compliment was that um, the nurses came to us and personally thanked us. Those were those four or five that you saw that finally, because they had been working there for like uh, 20 forever. Yeah. They go to the commission. That was very long. Well, it's the fact that there was such a um, very inflexible structure. Did it have to do with their attempt to control uh, either the quality or whatever they wanted to control? Was it a control mechanism? And wasn't there then a resistance to letting uh, the, uh, somebody else then uh, have some control or make it more flexible. That is true. It is, it is the whole organization structure that went to the control and command my God. They didn't want the nurses to have power or enough information about by the availability itself. Mm -hmm. So, from the center, uh, I'll offer to Yeah.
Digital MPC project now. We have like a great community of open source development and there are some states in Brazil that are adopting uh, open source project as priority for governmental for funding and all that. So uh, how these networks are like clear for us and transparent and this new residue is just showing what we are debating a lot in a lot of studies is that this work how this can inform uh, a policy maker uh, or, or our project. I wanted to ask you to tell, tell just a little bit about these social badges because uh, just the technology because from the sound of it it seems like once you can automate the process of gathering this information you can sort of make the decisions of who is in charge online and so forth. So uh, could you just say what the technology is about? I have one last question on that because the Twitter is better than the social badges than the actual design. Okay. No, I have no design. Other people have media labs. We I don't know if I should never relate to that. It's not really a question. But I felt that when it all comes to these kind of crisis, it's typically, unless people are very powerful about controlling who, you know, respecting the person who is in the team management, at least at the peer level, at each level, during times of crisis, I think people would naturally get to know the most. Like, oh my gosh, who knows this all about it? And then just, oh, and then just starting to gravitate to whoever seems most knowledgeable. Even in classrooms, you know, you know, as you start observing, you start noticing who knows more about the subject. In terms of the one about fix the problem or do something, and you start noticing the classmates seem to ask a person who comes to the answer. So when you talk about identifying two knowledge experience, um, I think a lot of times that probably naturally happens that people uh, are willing to see who is really, you know, knowledgeable in certain areas where they have uh, a passive course to more important to get done. You know, I'd like to build up on that. In fact, it's related to the command and control structure. Uh, at this hospital, specifically in health, the medical setting, yes, the person with the most knowledge is actually the side of navigation of them. But what accompanies that is the control and command and the uh, insecurity that if your weaknesses are exposed, you might fall from the high pedestal that you are occupying. And that's exactly what's happened in this case. There, there is the vacuum and the flows. They do not want to share the data data with the information with each other because the efficiency throughputs are in question. And related to that is the, uh, the uh, you know, there's a lot of HR, uh, uh, HR factors related to those, uh, the nurse ship timings, the nurse, nurse staffing, nurse uh, uh, what do you call it? incentive structures are all related to the patient throughput. So each of these departments, they first talk to each other, the nurses don't talk to each other, they control the information and they fight. Listen, I see that bed available. Why are you pushing patients there? Oh no, I reserved it for a VIP. I can't give it to you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, how do you know this bed is available in the first place? We haven't published it. So what comes with high expertise is this command and control. And so identifying those seven key knowledge experts in the system was maybe one step beyond the command and control because there are other people in the network who may not be perceived to be so highly specialized, who may not be perceived to have so much knowledge, but they're actually the common and this network, the, the social network is identifying. Because what is perceived? It's not the way to drive the not to know who knows more about certain subject matter. If you do it as in this person should know this in this group, who then is the best person to determine that role? You know, if they are you know, creating a, a competitive environment. So, I mean, if you sometimes, like, I think in education, for example, if you build, like, you know, system where you give word as a team, then you see the more of like a reason to work together and and then uh, create more efficient systems based on um, strengths, you know, not just strengths, but on certain circumstances. Yeah. That's a very valid point. And uh, it can have more identifying who is the actual knowledge expert can have various answers. In this case, the not knowledge expert that that informal nurse was the one who spoke with the flow, who communicated with the flow. So we knew that she was doing her job by trying to make that available. So in this case, if any one person is communicating communicating with flows on a frequent basis, so that person is a knowledge expert. But in other scenarios, if a person just talks too much, it may not be they may not be knowledge expert. But 
in this case. I want to ask, having seen lots of these patterns, is there one that where the pattern didn't seem to match up to anything that you could really find in the organization? Where does this fail? Actually, I think um, there are many instances where patterns we found were a total surprise in the managers because they didn't, um, uh, they weren't aware of what's going on underneath. But once we looked closer, <coughs> I'm sorry or happy to say, <laughs> it always it, it had a, 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 an excellent um, uh, real world explanation. And to give you a very short answer, don't be a So those communicators, those nurses, they are galaxies. And if you look for those, um, that's, that's your uh, knowledge base. For the social batch question, um, actually, um, cheap answer. Next week, I will go um, uh, very um, in great detail the German back example because that's that was done with the social batches. Um, in a nutshell, those are just um, sensors that you carry around your neck that uh, transmit how much you talk. But we don't get the, the cost of this analysis because of um, uh, privacy concerns, but uh, the, the, the variations in pitch, and then you can calibrate that, uh, how much you move, accelerometer, whether you are excited or bored. So that's what you get with the accelerometer. Then um, when you look into somebody else's face, that you get with an infrared sensor, and then how close you are, that you get with the Bluetooth sensor. That's how the social batteries that we have. And that tells you quite a lot, for example, as you will see, you can predict whether you are introvert, extrovert, neurotic, that's <laughs> 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 a lot. So is this, is this a standard sort of technology? You can just go on Amazon.com and buy no, it? this is something that was invented by Sandy Pendens group at the India Lab. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So this is something you're still sort of soldering by hand? And yeah, it's soldered by hand. It's uh, did, did available in like 200, but there is a sponsor there who would like to convert it into commercial technology. Um, and now we will be um, repeating our hospital experiment with this technology and uh, hopefully answer questions what are ways of making a group of 80 nurses more creative. Well, none of those things, though, would be could also go into like, culture, right? I mean, there's a single experiment and there's a group of other people. All these things you have to do is how close you are when you actually take something. Great comment. And yeah, we have big discussions about the differences in the South Korean culture, Finnish culture, and American culture. And, and one very interesting thing, and it has nothing to do with social batch, is the acceptance of Wikipedia in Korea compared to the acceptance of Wikipedia in Finland. Um, much smaller country, Finland, um, both leaders in um, technology. Do you want to tell that? Okay. Um, both, the, uh, both have a language that nobody else talks. So you would expect um, <laughs> they are, the, the Wikipedia in South Korea is 10 times bigger because at least 10 times bigger. You can have the networking effect, it should be even more than 10 times, but it turns out it's 10 times smaller or even more. And we, uh, then so there is a difference in culture and there's another system, I don't know whether you want to explain it, but then the Navar system, which um, is like Yahoo Answers, that takes on the, um, the role of Wikipedia, which means you post a question and get an answer, instead of contributing to a shared body of knowledge like the Finns do, that um, uh, is now available accessible to everybody. So there are big differences. And, and also in the way how you interact, uh, there are big some studies where it compared the Italians, the Germans, and uh, the Finns. And again, there are huge differences in the attitude towards hierarchy, for example, and so on. And so not the same pattern is creative or productive in Italy as it is in Finland, but the opposite. So um, I think now we should go to the... Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Time for a question. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple of words on something, things you've learned between about the difference between the knowledge experts, which seem to be the, the key players in this hospital example, uh -huh. and people who actually make the decisions. Because in general, say if you look at the US government, which means we have the experts and then the decision makers. Mm -hmm. 
and they're separated. And is that is that sort of the um, is that an efficient way to do things? Is that necessary? Um, is it just sort of a price? Well, I think the answer is there are decision makers which are peripheral to the network. And those are bad decision makers. And in the past, they could hide. And with such a technology, they come up. And I'm sorry for those guys to say to report that we did some projects where we found those people. And I can be relieved that the organization in this particular case had come to the same conclusions as us independently. So it wasn't really our analysis. It could not have been because when we do research projects, it always will be anonymized. But um, it, yes, short answer. Yes. Has anyone been demoted or lost their employment based on your analysis? No. Okay. Because we really do not give back any. I mean, you, oh, okay. you might be familiar with IRBs and so on, so that's okay. a no no. Oh, okay. It, yeah, it's always totally anonymized. Okay. <coughs> but have we. Um, uh, there, there were some opposite stories where the organization was concerned or, or they wanted to get let go people, let people go and uh, we said we shouldn't really do that because it turns out this guy is so important for the organization. So that was the only time that we uh, actually revealed some, some insights. And, and in the nurse example is the same. Like when those nurses, they, they were so, so happy that in the end, we finally could show that they had a central role. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the two days presentations and uh, a few, about half of next week's presentations are already online. On um, I put them up before. Class. Just IAP. There you will find PDF presentations. <coughs> There. And I was also asked by a student whether it's okay that he records my video, and I said yes. And um, we'll probably put that up um, uh, here also. That means if somebody wants to see uh, this thing um, uh, via video, it should also be online there. So if there are no more questions, then we could now uh, switch to the technical duty part, which as I said, it's mandatory, and if you don't want to dig uh, in, um, then thank you very much for coming, and see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>